On this damn episode of Tennessee Uncharted, we're gonna be talking all about dams, as you can see behind me. It's gonna be a damn episode. An episode all about dams. I'm Eric Baker, and I've lived in Tennessee my entire life. However, for the last decade touring the world, I've only seen it passing by from a windshield. But finally, Tennessee is calling me back where I belong. I want to rediscover how great my home state is, and I want you to come with me. We've spent a lot of time out on the water here on Tennessee Uncharted, which for most Tennesseans is a way of life. From navigation and electrification to recreation and making Tennessee a tourist destination, the waterways that wind through the three regions of Tennessee have in many ways served as the lifeblood of our growth and success. But if you take a look back in time, just a generation ago, you'll see that the landscape of our great state was in a different state entirely. Ravaged by raging rivers, rural restrictions, and aggressive erosion, the Great Depression hit the towns of Tennessee at a time when finances were already tight. But the enterprising efforts of Senator George Norris from Nebraska led to the creation of the Tennessee Valley Authority, a federally owned corporation aimed at generating economic development along with electricity. Over 80 years later, the nine dams along the Tennessee River and over 20 dams along our major tributaries are as much a part of the topography as the mighty Mississippi they feed into. But as conservationists have begun confronting issues like connectivity out west, it's raised questions about whether some dams have outlived their day. When you hear about hellbenders living in a little hole on the Roaring River, it's not difficult to believe that they're wreaking havoc on their habitat. But according to TWRA fisheries manager, Mark Thurman, it's actually the other way around. Beautiful spot that you've chosen for us. Yep, we're on Roaring River. Um, this is uh, one of Tennessee's state scenic rivers. Across the state, there's a, there's a growing interest in restoring connectivity in rivers where you can. Uh, of course, with the big reservoirs that uh, on the Tennessee and Cumberland River, those are in place, but there's a lot of benefit to restoring connectivity uh, in a river or stream, whether it's removing a culvert that allows, you know, five species of fish access to a river, to removing something bigger like this, which will open up to uh, a whole host of fish. Things like hellbenders, uh, mm -hmm. our largest salamander in the state, and, mm -hmm. and, a, and a species that we're very interested in. We have occurrences downstream, and we have occurrences upstream. We have multiple agencies involved. We have the, the Army Corps of Engineers are involved here. Uh, the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. This has got to mean a lot to a lot of people in this area. This is a place that, that people have been coming to fish and swim and play at for, right. for a very long time. What it really stands to do is boost the fishing farther upstream. But what makes this one unique is that we've got this structure that's failing that we really need to take care of it and, and get it out. This isn't about taking every dam that, that, that's possible out there. It's, it's, it's just simply evaluating opportunities that come along and, and looking at the balance of what the gain mm. is in the project. I'd love to take a look and walk upstream and kind of see what else is up there. And... Let's go take a look. As Mark mentioned, not every dam is bad news. And in many examples across the state, the benefits far outweigh the challenges. For this project in particular, however, that wasn't the case. In fact, surveys of species like hellbenders, which act as indicators of their environments, allowed wildlife specialists to assess that the failing dam actually was doing damage. I have something really important I want to ask you. What? I do think it's a we have literally been within the ecosystem, swimming around, mm -hmm. um, looking for hellbenders. And I guess, I mean, simple question, why are hellbenders here? Hellbenders are here because we've still got enough quality in the habitat that, that they can live here. Because when you go to a river where you have a healthy population, you'll see small and medium sized and, and then the large. One of the things that we've seen here are that we have a lot of larger hellbenders. We're not seeing smaller hellbenders and we want to, uh, to, to take that dam out 
and uh, open that up. When I was talking about fish moving up or other animals moving up river, mm -hmm. this area is, is one of the areas I've had in mind. You've got a, a nice pool here and I think I think we'll see uh, a change in, in uh, the fish that make it up here. So tell me about this guy. Dr. Freaks from Lee University in Cleveland, Tennessee and is uh, one of the Tennessee's hellbender experts. So is that a camera? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, yeah. that's just a bull scope. This one's waterproof. So. And I've never seen a hellbender up mm -hmm. close. So what size are we? All the ones in here are 18, 20 inches. Oh, wow. Yeah, so we're not talking small mm -hmm. salamander. Nope. Wow. Definitely giant salamander. Oh, man, <laughs> fingers crossed. Definitely <laughs> want to see one of these yeah. guys. Yeah, today we've been looking at some of the nest boxes or hellbender homes or whatever you want to call them, but basically concrete structures that we've put in that we hope hellbenders will use. <coughs> Occasionally you get uh, boxes that are used quickly, but in many cases it takes a little while for them to decide they like them. And of course you're competing with other rocks out there. One advantage is, is it's much less disturbing to, to survey if you have a lot of artificial habitat in where you can just, just have a quick look and see. And so the habitat may look great today, but the question is, is it the great 355? days a year. Mm. I can't ask the question whether the dam itself will improve this specific habitat, but what I know is it will produce a lot more habitat um, that hellbenders can use, uh, reproduce in, and that'll add a lot more resilience to the population as a whole. So what are things that, that we can do to, to help? Anything you can do to protect the riparian zone, uh, the corridor along the river, okay. um, the stabilized banks, and to keep farm soil out of the river, that's a big deal. Are you finding that it's getting better for the hellbender or is it getting worse? I believe over time, we'll see a, an improvement here. Awesome, awesome. Well, I wanna see one of these things mm -hmm. up close. So I'm gonna let y'all get back in okay. the water. Let us and, get in the water uh, yeah, the rock. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Sure. Oh, yeah. Many times in my life, I've stumbled across the fact that taking small steps can lead to big change. In this instance, removing a structure that has seen better days and limiting sediment can help restore the roaring river to the robust repository it once was. But as Martin mentioned, connectivity along some of our larger waterways looks a lot different. So I decided to meet up with the group who's giving to charity by getting out for a quick 652 mile trip up the Tennessee River. Welcome to the party, everybody. We are uh, locked up tight in Watts Bar Lock, actually. Pretty crazy. If you look down this way, that's the door they've closed, and this is the direction we're going. And we're all in here like one big happy family. We're here at the Tennessee River 600 at Chickamauga Marina, and today I'm gonna to be riding a jet ski from Chattanooga all the way to Knoxville, approximately 180 miles. So I brought a bunch of gold bond and a cushion for my bum bum. I'm ready to ride. I'll be honest, I've ridden my friend's jet skis before, circling the lake near their dock for the few appropriate laps given my age. Because let's face it, they make us all feel like a kid again. But then you inevitably hit that one wake wrong and rack yourself or jam your back and suddenly remember why you shouldn't get carried away anymore. I'd never really taken a jet ski out on the open water before and settled in for a long trip. And I wasn't particularly that interested in it or so I thought. But then my friend Terry Moore, TWRA boating officer, invited me on something called the Tennessee River 600, and the rest is history. 180 miles of history, in fact. <laughs> How cool is this, right? Oops. Myself and uh, another officer on this trip with the Tennessee River 600, and basically we serve as safety and support for the for the entire group on, along the entire trip mm -hmm. uh, for mechanical issues, you know, uh, first aid issues. We also coordinate with the locks and the lock masters, you know, to coordinate, uh, 
the, the jet skis being able to lock up or lock down through. Which we just did, and that was amazing, man. I've never experienced anything like yeah. that, and that's probably something very few people, I guess, get to experience. It but, is. I mean, when you talk about the waterways of Tennessee and everything, and, and the fact that you can go 600 miles all the way down the Mississippi, or down the Tennessee River. I down mean, the Tennessee, that, even that, to that, the Mississippi. If people hadn't been out on it, what are they missing? Well, they're missing the scenery for one thing. Mm -hmm. As opposed to traveling Tennessee by highway, there's just so much you do not see, and it's like a whole nother world. When you summarize the week, you know, as I told people that I was coming out here and just doing the one leg from Chattanooga to, to Knoxville, but I was like, hey, people have been out there, they're doing all 600 miles. If you could summarize that, summarize what this week is all about, I mean, how would you, how would you describe it? I would describe it, it's like, it's like the family vacation to the beach. You know, you can't wait to get there. You're thinking, man, I got a whole week to stay there. And before you know it, you're thinking, man, I got to pack my stuff up and go home. 600 miles seems like a long way, but when you, when you space it out and, and, and it's all coordinated, and, you know, there's a lot of cooperation between the people that are on the trip, the people that we, we interact with on the trip. Mm -hmm. uh, we stop at a lot of the state parks and stay overnight along the trip. 600 miles seems like a long way, but when you enjoy it just bit by bit by bit, it's like a good meal, you know. You can't, you can't believe it's gone. What I enjoy is at the end, people coming back up to me and go, you know what, once I stayed on that ski for a little bit, you know, for a little while, you know, I, I got it. Yeah. It, it means a lot to some of, the, some of those on the trip, specifically some of those have been, have family that uh, have used the children's hospital. I believe there's a children's hospital in Alabama and then a children's hospital in Knoxville. Yeah. And that money is raised for those two children's hospitals and, and, and donated to them by people that go on this trip. Mm -hmm. So it's having fun with a purpose. It's having fun with a purpose, that's right. Thanks for what y'all are doing, man. Oh, and and thank certainly you. thanks for letting me follow follow you around a little yeah, bit, you know, down. Over. <laughs> know. If it gets a little windy and rough here in a little while, I know where you're gonna be. I know, yeah. <laughs> and or just make sure if I start heading the wrong direction back the way yeah. you came, yeah. uh, holler at me and point yeah, me I in the right direction. Yeah, I wanna see a thumbs up, not, not <laughs> hey, I need that's some right. help, yeah. Ultimately, I did a lot more than just learn about connectivity on this trip. I actually connected with both the people and the environment around me as well. And given that it took just under a day's time, it doesn't seem half bad. Since their founding in 1933, the efforts of the Tennessee Valley Authority have prevented more than $5.4 billion in flood damage. And with the Tennessee Valley Basin, the area where water from the Tennessee River drains, spanning seven states across the southeast. Coordination is the name of the game. So before I stepped inside any of TVA's actual structures, they asked me to stop by the River Forecast Center in Knoxville to better understand the system of tributaries they take on every day. You are in TVA's River Forecast Center. Okay. Uh, we are a 24-7, 365-day staffed, and so we have folks here continuously around the clock monitoring flows downstream of dams, monitoring the level of the reservoirs, monitoring the amount of water that's coming through during, say, a winter flood. We're looking at how much rain fell out of the sky, how much of that ended up in a river, lake, stream, and then what is that going to do? What you're looking at here, we have 29 power dams. We've got 49 dams total that we manage. But the, you know the big dams, the big with the turbines, the big concrete structures mm -hmm. that people think of. There's 29 of those. We've got most of the big storage reservoirs: the Douglas, Cherokee, Norris, Fontana. Do you sleep well at night then? I guess knowing. I no, mean, it's raining hard. <laughs> <laughs> so when it does rain hard, is it like? Bee -doo 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 -doo? I mean, is it are like alarms going off and you're like calling the president? Or? You know, when the alarms go off it's a really bad day so we typically don't have alarms going off okay but we do have all hands on deck well hey i'm sure you've got a good. lot of stuff to do so uh thanks man Thank super cool <laughs> moving in and then sunshine but over here in this area yeah you got every game on right here <laughs> and that's with a better grasp on what goes into gauging water levels, I was ready to scale up my efforts. And holding around 830 million gallons of water, Norris Dam seemed like a great place to start. 
Well, man, here we are inside of Norris Dam. I'm super excited. Uh, like many dams, you know, I've seen it from the outside. I've driven over the top of it. Walk me through some of the things that you guys provide. So, I mean, a lot of people think of TVA as just a utility that we provide power. Totally. But really, we provide so much for the valley. Obviously, we provide generation. You know, we provide power. We allow people to turn the lights on in the morning. You know, we provide, you know, flood control. Uh, we provide recreation. You know, our units are off right now, and you've got fly fishermen in, in the river, and our units are our money makers. Okay. Yeah, so what company would turn off their money makers to allow people to fish, you know, or boat? Mm -hmm. Or like at the Ocoees, where they do rafting, whitewater rafting. The TVA was built for the people of the United States of America. We're not just a utility. You know, one, one other thing that we provide for is water quality. We actually inject liquid oxygen into the water to increase the dissolved oxygen content to allow for fish to be healthy in the rivers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, where we tie into the Ohio River, you couldn't get from there past Muscle Shoals up to Knoxville, but now you can with our lock system and, and the way we have our dams and how we operate. So a lot more than just turning the lights it on. Is, have to it be is, it is, it really is. So here at Norris, we have two generators. Each generator provides 65 megawatts of power. So for a total of 130 megawatts. And so what does that mean? If Norris was on an island, we would be able to produce power for 75,000 homes. Now, how does that work? You know, we have a 20 foot diameter penstock, you know, where water flows down through and hits our turbine and spins the turbine, spins the generator. We send it out to our transformers and it goes out to the grid. And there you have 65 megawatts per unit. We have a tailwater warning system that goes off about 10 minutes prior to starting a unit and basically warns the fishermen, hey, we're about to send a lot of water down river. It'll go off, the unit starts, five fishermen come out, and we raise the water level with one unit about four feet. Okay. With two units, we can raise the river level almost, almost eight feet. Wow. There's a, a change in almost eight feet. We generate per a schedule. And how is that determined is be basically between two entities. We have uh, what we call the balancing authority, which is down in Chattanooga, and they look at power demand. And then we have the River Forecast Center, which is in Knoxville, and they look at everything involving the river and the lakes. They look at lake levels, river levels, they monitor our dissolved oxygen content, um, they look at rainfall predictions, and so they determine when our units need to generate based on lake and river levels. Okay. And so those two come together, and they basically give a schedule out. And make a plan. And make a plan. Gotcha. And that's how our units generate. When someone comes to you with a negative view on dams, right. what, do right. you, what do you say to those people? Well, I talk about everything that we do. You know, if you look at some of the pictures around here and see what this area was, you know, back in the 20s and the 30s, mm -hmm. the Tennessee Valley was already in a depression prior to the U.S. going into a depression. And outside of your major urban developments, you didn't have electricity, it wasn't electrified. Mm -hmm. So imagine when this dam came into existence in 36, and we had a transformer out there and we had power going out to the grid. Now all of a sudden your home out here in, this, in the rural area had electricity. And you turned on your lights for the first time in your home, you know, not a candle. You know, what, what was that? You know, it's amazing. I can't even imagine what that was like. So this is the control room of Norris. Uh, this is basically the brains of the operation. All of TVA's hydroelectric plants are automated and remotely monitored. Basically, a schedule is downloaded into our system and the units can stop and start automatically. But if we have to, if there is an emergency or if we need to do maintenance, then we can operate those manually and start and stop the units and put them online from here as well. All right, let's do it. For them to build this dam back in the 30s, early 30s, you, know, you can see still the wood grain in the wall, you know, from where they had the wood forms. Yeah. You know, and all these nails, they didn't have nail guns back then. You know, and so it took, you know, an army to build this thing. Basically, between us and that door is like the lake. Yeah. Wow. It's a lot of water, a lot of water pressure on that door. Nobody bumped that door too hard. Looking at, we're out on the wing wall, and we got two different viewpoints here. We've got to my left is 
basically the tail race, or the, that's where the water comes out of the generator. To my right is what we call the spillway section of the dam. So we have three ways of moving water downriver. Our preferred method is definitely through the generators because those are our money makers, right? Yeah. Well, if we have to, we can either what we call sluice. And so these are our sluice gates, which is basically a low level exhaust from the lake. Or we can spill uh, with our spillway gates, which are up top. It's just amazing what we do and what, what we provide really for the people of the valley. It gives me a sense of pride. You know, when we have the opportunity to, to speak with people that that haven't seen what we do, you know, don't really have a good understanding of what TVA as a whole provides, mm -hmm. to see their eyes open up and be like, wow, I didn't realize you did that. You know, that just, that makes me so excited. Seeing both Norris Dam and the Tennessee Valley Authority in a whole new light, I was feeling pretty powered up. So I set out for one last aquatic adventure, all about exploring an alternate environment. Huh? Ah. During my tour of Norse Dam, Eric showed me many of the access points used for maintenance on sluices and spillways while not generating. But before I left, I had to ask, what happens if you need to do maintenance on the lake side? You dive, he told me. And with Norse standing at 265 feet high, that sounds like one heck of a dive. But the truth of the matter is, I'm not sure because scuba diving is always conveniently sat down towards the bottom of my bucket list, down around the really lofty aspirations, where you hide a few things, so it's excusable if you don't get to them. By the end of today, I will be an official scuba man. So I'm pumped up. Let's go get wet and cold. <laughs> scuba diving, let's do this. Tennessee scuba diving, this is what it looks like. Thanks, Jimmy. I don't know what I'd do without you. Well, Right. I'm but, still alive. I'm a little chilly, yeah. but still alive. It's a little alive. cool, but we got a couple of hot dogs in you. Yeah, absolutely. It's hot chocolate. Now so. I'm ready. I don't feel like I'm in Tennessee. Yeah. You know what I mean? It has a tropical uh, vibe down there, yeah. for sure. Well, and we even got some fish that following you around. You didn't see that, did you? I didn't Everybody. see any following me. I was trying to follow a couple in front of me. But, I mean, it's amazing. That's one of the coolest things, kind of being a, a fly on the wall underground. When you probably first went down, you maybe had a little apprehension at first, or what, yeah. what am I doing? But once you get down there and see it's no different than the pool, really. Yeah. Why should you scuba? Well, I mean, the biggest thing is going and, and looking at all the neat things underwater. You know, here, you know, it's fun. You know, people love to dive here and see some stuff. But once you go to some place like the Caribbean or Florida or something like that, where you have all the coral reefs and the colorful fish and, and all the things like that, including the sharks. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really, really neat to see. And I'm really saying to, sell them, <laughs> sell them on it. I, I'm not like I'm scared of it. We put together diving vacations where we go for a whole week and dive. And, uh, you know, you can dive two or three times a day, or you can dive four or five or six times a day. Mm -hmm. and, and do some night dives where all the neat things that hide during the day come out at night. Because even like this, I mean, diving in the ocean, I mean, that's a big, so big. I mean, this is, you know, I mean, this is yeah. accessible. It's hard to get lost here. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And it's beautiful. I mean, and the thing is, I mean, it's beautiful looking above the water. I mean, just right now, just yeah. looking around us, but under the water, man. Most people live their whole lives and they never know what's below the surface. Yeah. So you've devoted your life to scuba diving. And, uh, and I mean, what what is it that brings you back out here, um, you know, every day? Well, I mean, it's just fun. Working with the students, that's the fun part. I mean, you're helping them learn how to do something they probably never thought about doing before and kind of molding them into a, an actual diver so that they can go out there and have a lot of fun and, and be comfortable with what they're doing. And well, now that I'm officially warming back up, I think it's time that we go get our back. second dive. Go yes. Play around some more. Get me closer else, to know. being an yeah. official scuba, scuba man, get a scuba man. Certification, certification card so you go out and go dive. Go That's right. Boats then we can do vacations That's together, right. Jimmy. Go to we're going to be, we're going to be yeah. best buds. <laughs> Let's go get wet. Yeah.
Diving turned out to be one of those adventures where I acquired something pretty exceptional. After just a couple of classes, it was no longer all about airways, but instead became all about exploring. It's one thing to see underwater, and entirely another to be underwater. As it turns out, the dialogue about dams runs pretty deep. In some systems, they can stifle the circle of life, and in others, they can provide significant benefit. In the end, I found that it all comes down to a matter of balance. For the rapids of the Roaring River, bringing repair to the river means restoring the balance. And for the thousands of families who helped construct the dams of the Tennessee Valley Authority, and the millions who've drawn from their power grids ever since, Repairmen erecting reservoirs that could balance the flood tables when the Tennessee took on more than her banks could bear. With only 180 miles under my belt, I've got a lot more water to cover if I'm gonna gather up all the answers. But seeing as how I can now travel above and below water, there's nothing to stop me.